Okay, so today we're going to talk uh, chapter four, which is about climates and biomes. And what I'm going to do in this video is talk more about uh, the cause of climates and the layers of the atmosphere rather than focus on the biomes, because um, that would take this lecture way, way too long. Um, but what I have done is make sure that the major characteristics of each of the biomes are listed on each slide. And then the climatograph, which we'll talk about in a second, and the place on the map would be on another slide. And you'll be responsible for, for filling in a chart that will help you uh, when it's time to take the exam. So this, this picture is a picture of an acacia tree in Kenya, in Africa. And the quickest way to talk about that intro story is that in 2003, um, flooding occurred in Kenya, killing people, damaging their water supply, um, and affecting many millions of people who had no real access to um, food or drinkable water. Um, waterborne diseases like cholera started to increase, and then the rains just did not stop again. Whereas in another part of the country, the summer rains that normally come to end their dry season did not come and they went through a prolonged drought. And the point of this is that global processes are what drive the rainfall patterns. And so because of past usually general predictable patterns, uh, Kenya is usually prepared for their dry season and their wet season and for reasons that are not really known, um, those did not happen and it was the opposite and the people were not prepared and, and some died and then just others were were affected. Uh, so make sure you read that intro story on page 87. Whenever you're watching the weather on the TV, weather is the short-term conditions of the atmosphere in a given area at a given time. So usually they're going to indicate on their weather cast the temperature, the humidity, what type of clouds, the type of precipitation, wind speed and pressure and pressure we'll find out has to do with what kind of weather will come with it. Usually you can't forecast more than several days in advance and once you get beyond five days the weathermen are just going on previous patterns but really don't know what's going to happen beyond five days. Um, but when you take all that weather data and you have an average that is your climate. So climate is average weather that occurs in a given region over a long period of time. Um, typically about 35 years is what a climate is considered as. The Earth's atmosphere consists of five layers of gases. You've got the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. The two most important layers that we study in environmental are the troposphere and the stratosphere. The troposphere is the bottom most layer, the one closest to the Earth's surface, and it goes roughly 16 kilometers above Earth, and this is where our weather occurs. So usually, as you go up into the app, not usually, it does happen, as you go higher up into the atmosphere, pressure is less intense, gravity is less intense, and so the particles will start to get further away as you get away from the Earth's surface. So as you are closer to the surface, is as in the troposphere, those molecules are a lot closer together and there's higher pressure. Um, this is where we have our weather. Right above, I'm going to go to this picture really quick. There we go. Right above the troposphere, you have the stratosphere. And this is a really important layer because it absorbs uh, the damaging UV rays from the sun and that has our ozone layer. And our ozone layer is simply an, a molecule of O3, so an oxygen plus an extra um, O. And we get into uh, almost a whole chapter about ozone uh, during second semester. So just be aware that stratosphere is most important because the ozone here absorbs those harmful UV rays. Before I get to the thermosphere, I'll mention the mesosphere. The mesosphere basically means middle layer, and there's really not a whole lot known about this layer because it's too high for weather balloons to uh, 
um, look into and it's too low for satellites to get to that are up in space. So not a whole lot is known but it does have the coldest part of Earth's atmosphere and this is where we generally see most meteorites burn up. The thermosphere is above the mesosphere and this also blocks harmful x-rays and when you see, have, if you've ever seen the northern lights or aurora borealis, this is the layer of the atmosphere where that happens. Okay, so you have um, this charged electrical gas and the solar energy is interacting with our magnetic field and creates those northern lights or the aurora borealis. And the top layer there is the exosphere and that's basically outer space. You do need to know the order of the layers. And I came up with a little, what are those called, acronyms. And starting from the bottom up, so it would be troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, you could say two stakes makes Tommy excited. As, ener as the sun's energy passes through the atmosphere and strikes land and water, it warms the surface of the earth. But this warming does not occur evenly across the planet. Well, why is that? There are three reasons for unequal heating of the earth. The first is the angle uh, at which the sun's rays strike are different depending on where it's hitting. So at the equator, it's going to strike perpendicular and at the poles, it is more oblique. I'm going to go back to this slide in just a second. So if you notice on the picture on the right here, uh, as it's near the equator, or in this case it looks like it's hitting uh, the Tropic of Cancer, uh, they're more direct. And so if the rays are more direct, it's going to be more concentrated. So notice this top layer of sunlight reaching, it has to go through more atmosphere and once it hits the surface it's more spread out. Notice that angle, it's not straight on, it's more of an oblique angle. Notice this would be areas in the poles where it receives a lot less sunlight. The amount of surface area over which the sun's rays are distributed, so the more direct the more concentrated the small area. And that's what I was saying. Imagine that this beam right here is a flashlight on a basketball. And so as you shine it right there on the basketball, you'll notice a nice circular concentrated area of light. But if you tilted the basketball and put it higher towards the poles, you'll notice there's more of an elongated beam and it's not necessarily circular. It's more elliptical. So when there's uh, a greater angle and the, the sunlight is more spread out. This picture on the left here was showing how solar uh, insulation changes throughout the seasons and I, and I liked this picture because you can see in the June solstice which is the summer uh, when the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun notice that the most direct rays are at the Tropic of Cancer here Okay, and the northern hemisphere is exhibit, uh, exhibiting, uh, experiencing summer, whereas the, the southern hemisphere is experiencing winter. The middle picture here are both equinoxes, so the autumnal equinox in September, which we just passed, and the vernal equinox in the spring. All areas will get 12 hours, well, except for the poles, except the, for the extreme poles, all areas will get 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of darkness. And then in the December solstice in the northern hemisphere we are facing away from the sun. So we're experiencing winter and the sun's rays are most direct right here at the Tropic of Capricorn which would be in the southern hemisphere they're having their summer. And you can see also if you were looking down on the earth from above it this is what the axis would look like. The third thing 
that contributes to unequal heating is albedo, and that's an important vocabulary word, albedo. It just simply, and it's usually given off as a percentage, the percentage of reflection of solar insulation. So white is more reflective, therefore it will have a higher albedo. So black asphalt would have a low albedo because it absorbs more energy. Let me, let me go to this one really quick, sorry. So the Earth's average albedo is about 30%, but notice how it will change depending on the location. So clouds can reflect anywhere from 10 to 90% of sunlight. Fresh snow is probably the biggest area of albedo and the biggest reflection. Um, and notice the asphalt at 5 to 10%, very low uh, because it's dark and it absorbs more heat. And uh, croplands and grasslands just depends on how dense the forest is um, and how dark it is. So going back to this one, talking about the angles of uh, solar insulation or radiation, notice at the equator, it will hit most directly, so it's a 90 degree angle. In the mid-latitudes, which is where we live, the United States, it's not ever perpendicular, it's not ever head-on, and so we don't get as more, as, as more concentrated uh, solar insulation than they do at the equator. And then the poles, since it's even further north of the equator than we are, will get even less sunlight and notice the angle that it's even more spread out. So we've seen why there are, why there is uneven heating of the earth. And so now we're going to see how that drives the circulation of air in the atmosphere. Well, air has four properties that's going to determine how it's going to circulate in the atmosphere, and that's density, water vapor capacity, adiabatic heating or cooling, and latent heat release. So the density of air determines how it's going to move. Less dense air rises and denser air sinks. So at a constant atmospheric pressure, warm air will have a lower density than cold air. So because of this density difference, warm air has a less density than cold air, then warm air will rise. And you've probably noticed that if you live in a two-story house, in the winter time, if you had to put on the heater, it gets really hot upstairs, but then it's still kind of cold downstairs. And the same with the AC in the summer. You have to blast the AC so that it'll get cooler upstairs and then it's freezing downstairs. It's because the heat rises. Warmer air also has a higher capacity for water vapor than cold air. So, especially here, we know in San Antonio, hot summer days are going to be associated with high humidity because that warm air contains a lot of water vapor and it can hold more. So as the air temperature gets uh, colder, it has a capacity to hold less water vapor and the humidity will decrease. So in our, in our summers, the higher the temperature, the more humid it can be. A third property of air is its response to changes in pressure. As air starts to rise in the atmosphere, and keep in mind that it would rise because it's warm, okay, because warm air rises, the pressure is going to decrease. And that kind of makes sense because just like the molecules of the atmosphere, uh, the pressure of them decreases as you go up, so do the, the, uh, the temperatures of the air. So warm air will start to rise, its pressure decreases, and the air around it expands. This expansion actually lowers the temperature of the air, and that's called adiabatic cooling. On the other hand, when air starts to come towards the surface and sink, Imagine all those particles getting closer and closer together and hitting the Earth's surface. It kind of makes sense that the pressure would increase. If it's increasing, that higher pressure forces the air to decrease in volume, which makes sense because all the particles are getting closer, and that will decrease, um, excuse me, and that decrease raises the temperature. So it's called adiabatic heating and cooling, and adiabatic means the input or output of heat into a system. 
And so I don't think that weathermen ever talk about the adiabatic cooling, but at certain temperatures, water will hold so much water vapor, and so that will determine dew points and, and things like that, much more than we need to know in here. But the idea here is that as air rises, a warm air rises, the pressure decreases, the air expands, it gets cooler. Once the pressure starts to increase because the air is sinking, uh, the air will decrease in volume. Finally, there's latent heat release. So we know, and we'll talk about it again in a minute, that the sun is the driving force of water evaporating. And so when water evaporates, it means it's getting warmer, it rises and cools and condenses. And then you have clouds. So it'll enter the atmosphere and the sun is providing this energy for all that to happen. So when the water vapor starts to condense into liquid energy, um, into liquid energy, into liquid water in the atmosphere, energy is actually released. And this is called latent heat release. It's important because this means that whenever water vapor in the atmosphere condenses, the air is going to become warmer and this warm air will rise, which will then have less pressure and you'll tend to have precipitation. So now that we know the properties of air, we need to look at how this is circulating in the atmosphere. And the atmosphere circulates in these convection currents, just like how in the mantle, uh, the mantle is circulated and has convection currents that moves the plates around. So it's not an unknown phenomenon. And I'm going to show an illustration in a second, but the three terms associated with the convection currents Atmospheric convection currents are Hadley cells, intertropical convergence zone, or the ITCZ, and polar cells. The Hadley cells are these giant convection currents in the atmosphere that happen between the equator, zero degrees, and 30 degrees north and south of the equator. The intertropical convergence zone, or the ITCZ, is the area that will receive the most intense sunlight and where the Hadley cells converge. The polar cells are the convection currents that are uh, form at 60 degrees north and south of the equator and sink at the poles, which are 90 degrees north and south of the equator. So let's look at how these actually work. We'll start off at the intertropical convergence zone. And this is where the sunlight is usually hitting most directly in and around the equator. So as we discussed earlier, as there's more heat, more heat from the sun is driving evaporation. So it's warming up that air. The air is going to start to rise because warm air rises. Okay? As it rises, it will start to cool and condense, hence why we have clouds here and precipitation. This also means that there's less pressure. So keep in mind that low pressure equals precipitation of some kind. Okay, that's why there's lots of rain in the rainforest and in the tropics because all that sunlight hitting is causing the water to evaporate or rise. Warm air rises, cools, condenses, forms precipitation. So those will start, uh, the air will continue to rise and basically just like um, the convection currents in the mantle, once it gets away from the, the the hottest area it'll start to cool down and it does that here too. It releases its energy I keep losing my arrow, here we go, it releases its energy and the warm air displaces the cooler air and makes it drier. Well then that cool dry air, now that it's cooled because it reached higher in the atmosphere, that cool dry air will start to sink. As it sinks the pressure gets higher as we approach the surface so higher pressure makes all those particles come together, the molecules in the atmosphere come together, and they're going to heat up. So as it reaches the Earth's surface, there we go, it will warm, it'll be warm and dry. And where these Hadley cells happen to start sinking and hit the surface is around 30 degrees north and south of the equator.
and if you notice, which you will in a little bit, that on a map, generally areas 30 degrees north and south of the equator are deserts, and that's why we have deserts, because they are high pressure zones. So keep that in mind. Low pressure zones equal rain or precipitation, and high pressure zones experience dryness. There is another um, set of cells, and those are the polar cells, and what's happening here um, are the convection currents that are formed by the air that starts to rise at 60 degrees north and south of the equator, and then we'll, the same processes that's going on with these Hadley cells here, same processes, um, and then they'll start to sink at the poles, which is 90 degrees. So in between these Hadley cells and polar cells are the mid-latitudes. So that's where the United States basically is, and we know that we don't live in a tropical rainforest, and we don't live in polar cold tundras. We're in the middle. And so we're subject to more mixture of this really cold air and really warm tropical moist air, um, and therefore that lends itself to our very diverse uh, weather patterns throughout the United States. And in fact, the United States has the most diverse weather in the world. Because what's happening is you've got some of the cold air from the polar uh, regions mixing in with some of the warmer air from the tropical regions. One thing we haven't really discussed yet is that the Earth is rotating. So if the Earth didn't rotate, you'd have these perfectly straight convection currents we don't have that because the Earth is rotating. Now the Earth, because all locations on the Earth have to complete one revolution every 24 hours, hence our day, Earth has a greater circumference near the equator than the poles, so its speed is going to have to be faster at the equator than the poles. Because the places around the, the, the equator have a much farther distance to go to make one revolution than the poles do. So it's going to have to rotate much faster. I hope that makes sense. So what that means though is that the faster rotation speeds closer to the equator will cause a deflection of objects that are moving directly north and south. So imagine this. If you, if you notice first, sorry, if you're looking down on the earth as in the left picture, the Earth is spinning counterclockwise, okay? It rotates counterclockwise. Now, if I was standing at the North Pole and I threw a baseball, it would be deflected to the right in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, that may look from your position right here, left, but you have to be, you have to imagine yourself standing at the North Pole. As you throw that ball, it would be deflected left because of the spin of the Earth in the Northern Hemisphere. So notice that if the Earth did not rotate, the ball would just go in a straight line. But the Earth does rotate. So as the Earth is going this way, counterclockwise, the object being thrown in the Northern Hemisphere will deflect to the right. If I was on the Southern Hemisphere, and I threw an object from the South Pole, it would deflect to the left. So if you kind of imagine putting yourself in this position or this position, they're both actually being deflected left. So if that doesn't make sense, make sure you let me know in class. So if the, air, if the Earth didn't rotate, the air in each of these convection cells, the Hadley cells and the polar cells, would simply move directly north and south of the equator and then back again. But because it doesn't, we have all of these winds and these prevailing wind systems, and, and that's how we know which direction generally our weather systems move, is a combination of the convection currents and the Coriolis effect. So here you see in the U.S. we have the westerlies, which means that most of our weather systems move from west to east because the predominant wind direction of the U.S. is west, so no, notice here. So I've got my Hadley cells, let's go back a second, I've got my Hadley cells, so it's rising 
here at the, ET, the ITCZ, the air is rising, producing rain. It eventually sinks. It eventually sinks. Okay, so here in these areas, I should expect deserts. And then I have my poles here, my polar cells, and my polar cells. Okay, so in between there, I mentioned that there was going to be, in between the Hadley cells and the polar cells, that there would be this mixture of cold air from the poles and warm air from the tropics. And so as that's mixing, plus you have the rotation of the earth, it will cause you to have these westerlies, westerlies, and these easterly trade winds. So next time you're watching the weather and you're watching the national weather, see which direction those storms, if we have storms or a cold front, see what direction it's coming from. You will notice that they come from the west. Okay, so one more thing is to think of the convection cells and the Coriolis effect as let's look at this, this southeast trade winds right here. When the Hadley cells start to sink at 30 degrees south, okay, the air, remember, or not the, well, the air too, but remember that objects are deflected to the left in the southern hemisphere because of the Coriolis, the deflected to the left, deflected to the left, because it's going back towards the equator. In the northern hemisphere, the air is sinking, going back towards the equator, and it gets deflected to the right and that's why these trade winds are going east. Okay, so the seasons. Hopefully by now that you know the reason for the seasons is the tilt of the Earth's axis at 23 and a half degrees, which is also the latitude of the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. So when the southern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, as in here, when the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, we are experiencing summer. And so that June solstice will come June 20th or 21st. When we are facing away from the sun at the December solstice, December 20th or 21st, we are experiencing winter. But notice how the southern hemisphere is facing the sun, and so the southern hemisphere is experiencing summer when we have winter. Then when you have the equinoxes, you have the autumnal equinox, which just happened. The earth is not tilted towards or away from the sun. Therefore, uh, all regions of the earth are going to get 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. And the same thing happens in March. So now, as we're moving towards, now that we're in the fall, where's my arrow? Now we're in the fall and moving this way towards the December solstice, the amount of daylight that we have decreases. This also comes from our position around the sun. We are actually closest to the sun in January. We're just pointed away from the sun. And because the sun sits at one um, kind of towards one side of the ellipse that we are revolving around, the, Earth, the Earth's orbit around the sun, um, it actually moves faster. So we're tilted away from the sun and we're moving faster around the sun, therefore our daylight is less. So far we've talked about these processes that influence Earth's climate. First was unequal heating of the Earth, then was the convection currents, then it was the rotation of the Earth with the Coriolis effect, and then the Earth's orbit around the Sun on a tilted axis which causes the seasons, and there's one more and that's ocean currents. Ocean currents are driven by a combination of temperature, gravity, prevailing winds. Prevailing winds are basically the um, the major winds, so the westerlies are the prevailing wind system in the United States. The Coriolis effect and then the location of the continents. So as we already know, the tropics are going to receive the most direct sunlight throughout the year. And so because it's generally warmer climates, the water is going to be 
generally warm there as well. So warm water, just like warm air, is going to expand and rise. And this will actually raise the water surface a little bit higher in the tropics than in the mid-latitudes. Gyres are large-scale patterns of water circulation that redistribute heat. And so the, these big circular um, currents that uh, redistribute heat. And the currents will rotate clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. So notice these gyres here. There's a gyre, a gyre, a gyre, a gyre. Um, notice that generally, not always, but generally on west coasts there are cold currents. So your California current is a cold current. Hence, why not a whole lot of people like to go swimming um, off the coast of California. It is cold. Whereas the east coasts have warm currents. So here is our Gulf Stream and that makes the Gulf of Mexico and up the eastern seaboard warm and so that's where more people are going to swim and in the Caribbean as well. Notice it's surrounded by these warm currents. West coast of South America the Peru current is cold and the east current I mean excuse me the eastern side has a warm current. These sections right here that are dark blue are called upwelling zones and what happens in an upwelling zone is that all these nutrients as the surface waters are diverging and moving away from each other these deeper waters rise and replace the water well that deeper water is going to be cold and so that cold water brings nutrients from the ocean bottom and it will support um, fish populations and so these areas that have upwelling if you notice them here rely on these upwelling patterns to feed their fish and so fish is a major commodity in those areas. So the main idea here to remember are that these large gyres redistribute heat throughout the water on earth. The west coasts have cold currents and the east coast have warm currents. And there's the upwelling. There is another uh, oceanic circulation and this is called the thermohaline circulation and this is going to drive the mixing of these surface waters and deep waters. These here are basically surface currents and then you have these other deep somewhat cold water currents that are part of the thermohaline circulation. And so scientists believe and it's still kind of a newer science, a young science, um, that this process is, is so important for moving heat and nutrients around the globe, particularly um, along the bottom of the ocean. And this is more driven by salt or the salinity. So what happens is that we'll start in the Gulf of Mexico. We know that that's already a warm current. So as the Gulf Stream starts to go north, to the North Atlantic, it will either be warm and it evaporates or it gets so cold that it freezes up. Well, we know that salt doesn't evaporate or freeze, so that salt remains behind. And so that increases the salinity of that water. So as you increase the salinity and the, the decrease the temperature, that cold salty water will start to sink and it will mix with the deeper ocean waters. So those two things will create the movement that is needed to drive this deep cold current that moves past Antarctica and northward to the Pacific Ocean. Um, oh, that's out of place in a way. So let's look at this again. So let's start right here. The Gulf Stream is warm and as it moves north into the Atlantic, some of the water is going to freeze and some will evaporate along the way. If it freezes up or evaporates, it leaves behind that sal uh, salt and so that saline water will start to sink 
and as it travels along the ocean bottom, at some point will start to rise back to the surface and becomes a surface warm current. If you see that. And then it will travel back and start again. So it's this major uh, distribution of heat and nutrients. Ocean currents can affect the temperature of nearby land masses and this is completely true of, of California as well. There are some locations in California that have the same uh, latitude as in uh, the Wobosh area, the Washington, um, Boston, um, Baltimore, New York area. Same latitudes, but we know that California is a lot more sunny and warmer than the East Coast. And it's because that weather, that climate is moderated by that cold current. Same thing on this slide as in England. England is approximately the same latitude as Canada, but it's 20 degrees warmer. So let's look at that right here. Excuse me, here it is. Here's England, and notice that it has that Gulf Stream that is moderating that climate to where it's 20 degrees warmer, 20 degrees C, than here in Newfoundland, Canada, and we know Canada is really quite cold. So ocean currents have a great effect on um, moderating climates in certain areas. El Nino is a phenomenon that happens every three to seven years, and it's basically um, because of the way that the atmosphere and the ocean interact with each other, and it causes the surface currents in the Pacific Ocean to reverse direction. They don't really know what the cause is uh, for when it happens. We just know that when it happens, we know the effects, but we don't really know exactly why. So notice in the top picture, in a normal year, um, the trade winds go from east to west. And that is a result of the Coriolis effect and the normal um, Hadley cells. And so deep water moves upward, as you see here, and you have upwelling. And upwelling is bringing those nutrients in to the coastline so that you have a very good fish population. Then in an El Nino year, it switches and the trade winds go the other direction and the surface water starts to sink where it used to actually have upwelling. So you don't have that good fish population and the fish market actually declines in Peru or other areas. The slide is just going over what I just said. And so it will change uh, the climates, or the, well I should say I guess the, the temporary climates of the areas. Um, in the United States it affects them because the southern United States would have cooler and wetter conditions and then in the southern hemisphere they would have unusually dry weather. La Nina occurs in years that are not part of El Nino um, and these are characterized by unusually cold ocean temperatures in the Pacific whereas El Nino would have unusually warm uh, ocean temperatures in the equatorial Pacific. Rain shadow as effect is an area how land masses can affect precipitation patterns. We notice this a lot in the Pacific Northwest up in Washington State and Oregon where the uh, the coastline is basically littered with mountains. So what happens is as the winds approach the mountain, well they have nowhere to go but up, so the winds will go up the mountain. Well remember that as air rises it cools and condenses and forms clouds so it will rain. Once that water gets over the hump of the mountain, it will start to sink. So as that air sinks, the pressure increases and there leads to dry weather. This leads to a rain shadow on the lee side of the mountain, which is the side with no rain, um, because of the increased pressure. On the windward side of the mountain, on this side, you've got all the rain. So I just explained all that.
and you can also read this in more depth later or you can push pause. So I'm just about on the last slide now. Variations in climate will determine the dominant plant growth forms of terrestrial biomes. So climate's going to affect the distribution of species around the globe. I think that sounds pretty logical. Organisms will possess distinct growth forms due to their adaptations to local temperature and precipitation patterns. And finally, biomes are areas that have the presence of similar plant growth forms possessing similar temperature and pre precipitation patterns. Now one thing, I'm not going to go through all of these so you will need to go back and do them, but each biome here will have a picture of the biome, a location on the map, and a climatograph. We're actually going to be working with climatographs in class. Note that in the textbook they will have lines for both and when we work with them in class um, the temperature will be a line and the precipitation would be a bar graph, not a line. So when you complete the chart outside of class, you're going to be filling in information like what kind of latitudes these biomes occur in, what's the average annual temperature, the average annual precipitation, and then dominant plant and animals in those areas. I don't expect you to memorize everything for every biome, um, but know the basics and where they occur. So this is the time to be looking through these and, it, and you'll notice that I just put um, the major descriptions for each biome here and you'll need to fill out your chart and ask questions along the way. Okay, so this is the end of chapter four. Make sure you go back and read the full PowerPoint so that you have um, all the biome information.